So you have uh, one or two problems about thin films. So let's say we have a beam of light that's coming into this thin film. Let's say it's just coming in normal to the film. So here's the sur one surface of the film and here's the other surface. What happens to the beam of light when it hits the surface? Well, we know that part of it will be transmitted and part will be reflected. So here's the part that was reflected. By the way, in reality, the part that's reflected would be reflected along the same exact path that it came in on. But just so I have room, I'm going to draw it slightly, slightly, slightly below. Okay. Now. That light here, we've got some of it got reflected, and eventually it's going to hit the screen. All right, and then what about the light that got transmitted? Well, some of that will be reflected by the other surface of the film. A film has two surfaces, right? Um, there's here's one surface of the film, and here's the other surface. So this region right here is the filmy stuff itself. So here we might have air, and here we might have air, and here we might have a film of oil or water or whatever. All right, now what happens to uh, the light that gets here? Well, of course, some of the light is going to keep being transmitted. And this light we don't care about, because it just goes off into outer space. That's not interesting to us. But a fraction of this light will be reflected again. So some of this light that came in here reflects off. And again, it would really reflect along the same exact path it came in on. But I'm drawing it down here so I have space. And uh, some of the light that's reflected from here, a lot, some of it will go through this surface as well and just keep on going straight. All right, and then notice, remember all these beams are really on the same exact place. So they're really, these, now I have two beams of light, two reflected beams of light that are going to hit the screen. And they're really gonna, both going to hit at the same place, right? Because they're really on the same path. I just drew them askew so we can see them all. So it's not like it's really curving over here. It's just that they're really all going to be at the same point over here. Well, this is the situation we've been talking about over and over today when we have uh, light that was originally in phase, but then splits up so that the different beams travel different distances. All the situations we've seen before was when the original light was in phase. Obviously, the light was in phase here because it started as a single beam. The light here started as a single beam, but then the light gets split up, and one part of the light travels a longer distance than the other. That's what all of the examples we've seen today were about. Light that was originally in phase, um, but then it splits up and the two different beams travel different distances. So when they converge again on the screen, they um, might be out of phase because they've gone different distances. So the phase length difference is the, is the distance in the film? Ah, yeah, so you could use the distance in the film to figure out the path length difference. The path length difference. So if this distance is D, I don't know if they use this symbol in the book, but if the distance was D here, um, then the, dis then the, di the path length difference would be 2D. That's a common mistake, yeah. So the total path length difference would be 2D. All right, and then we know um, that we can then use that path length difference to determine whether the two lights would come together on the screen in phase or out of phase. If they're in phase, we'd get a bright spot, but if they're out of phase, we'd get a dark spot. And what we do here is that we can change the wavelength. If one wavelength gives us constructive interference here, then if we use a different color, that might give us destructive interference here. Why? Because, what's that? Why is it? Well, um, remember that in general, that in a simplified way, you get constructive interference if the path length difference is equal to a wavelength, mm -hmm. right? But if the path length difference is equal to, is equal to the wavelength for red light, it's not going to be equal to the wave, wave, wavelength for green light. But isn't it if you shine one monochromatic light, then it would just be the same. Oh, yeah, so what I meant to say is, let's say we start by shining one monochromatic red light. And let's say that that gives us a bright red spot over here. And then let's say we turn off the red light, and we turn on a green light for the same exact film. Let's say we do a spot in a different place. 
Well, the spot would still be here. All the spots are going to be here because the light beam is normal, right? Oh, so this is a little bit different than before. We're not talking about a whole series of spots. We're not talking about a whole series of spots. Since the light is coming in normal to the film, all the spots are going to be at this one. We're really only talking about one spot. Now we're just talking about one spot. Yeah, in the previous examples with the slits, we had a screen that would have a whole bunch of spots on it. Different spots at different angles. But now we're thinking about a beam that's coming in normal to the film. So when it reflects, it's only going to hit one point on the screen. And the only question is, is it going to give us a bright spot on the screen, or a medium bright spot, or a dim spot, or a zero spot? And that depends on whether the two beams combine constructively or destructively. So if the path length difference here happens to be just right for red light to combine constructively, it's not going to be just right for, say, another color to combine constructively. So changing the wavelength here is going to change uh, what the brightness of the spot is here on the screen. And this is important. I think they have like a butterfly question in the handout when they're talking about how do you get such a pure blue from the butterfly wings? How do you get such a pure, uh, pure blue from the butterfly wings? And the answer is pretty much um, that the butterfly wing is kind of like a thin film. There's one surface of the butterfly wing and there's another surface of the butterfly wing. So some of the light reflects from one surface and some of the light reflects from the other surface. Uh, and then when you perceive the light over here, when you perceive the light, well I guess it turns out that the, um, the uh, evolution has made it so that the distance of the thin film in the butterfly wing is just right um, so that it's blue, the blue light that reflects very brightly. The blue light combined, the blue elements of the light give you very bright. Because of course, the butterfly is just getting hit by white, by white sunlight, right? If the butterfly is being hit by white sunlight, why do we just get that light blue, that light blue color? Well, it's because the path length difference based on the, thin, on the butterfly wing's uh, thickness here happens to be just right, so that the blue light combines very constructively. Uh, the two beams combine constructively, and I guess a lot of the other wavelengths would combine destructively, and they get canceled out. Roughly speaking. So one way that an animal can control its colors is by having certain pigments. If you have certain pigments, then the pigments in your skin absorb certain wavelengths of light. But the butterfly is not absorbing the other colors of light. It's just that because of this interference phenomenon, the different colors are reflecting in such a way that um, they give us this destructive interference. So this is a different way of adjusting your colors that's different from pigments. And according to the book, this gives you some effects that you couldn't really get with the pigments. Or that was in your homework or whatever. All right, this is... Uh, Uh, there's a slight oversimplification here. There's some complications we didn't talk about. For example, sometimes when light reflects from a surface, it actually changes phase. Uh, I don't remember the situations for that, but sometimes when light reflects from a surface, it changes phase. Also, we know that the wavelength of the light inside the film can be different from the wavelength outside the film because um, we know that when you go from one medium to another, your speed changes, your wavelength changes. So there's some complications here. You wouldn't be expected, I don't think, to work through all those complications, though. Again, you're just going to be given a formula. There's a formula in the book, or you'd be given a formula, and you just have to plug in. So the only thing that's important is to understand the basic idea of why we're getting interference here. The basic idea for why we get this interference from a thin film is that the single light has, uh, gets split up into two reflected beams. The beam that reflects from the first surface of the film, and the beam that reflects from the second surface of the film. And then when those two beams come together again at your eye, since they've traveled different distances, um, depending on the wavelength, they may or may not be, uh, they may or may not be uh, in phase with each other anymore. The colors that are in phase are going to be perceived very strongly over here, and the colors that are not in phase anymore are going to be perceived very dimly, and that gives you an interesting... So the whole point here is like if you look at a thin film of oil, say, on the sidewalk, you notice that you get these very bright colors, or um, uh, what, what's the word, brilliant colors uh, from those kinds of thin films of oil, and this is the basic reason because um, the light is reflecting off both surfaces and some of the colors are, ref are um, con combining constructively and coming out very strongly and the other colors are being canceled by destructive uh, interference. <laughs>